Good afternoon and welcome to the Orlando Sentinel Editorial Board's interviews with the candidates for State House District 38, which is based in Seminole County. Um, today we are joined by our Republican incumbent, uh, State Rep David Smith, and his challenger, who is a Democrat from Altamont Springs with a background in nonprofits. So without further ado, I'm going to dive right into the question that is the number one issue, the only duty that lawmakers have to accomplish, which is writing the budget. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, um, Florida's budget for the past couple of years has been fat with federal cash. And that's going to start to dry up. But, um, and, and, and as we now know, it may happen faster than we think if the state catastrophic fund takes the kind of hit that it may take in the next 72 hours. So what I would say is, as Florida goes forward and faces the loss of the federal funding and other budgetary pressures, um, how should the state adjust its revenue picture to accommodate that? And we'll start with um, Representative Smith. Well, I tell you, I think your data may be a little bit off. The, the federal funds that have flowed into Florida over the last couple of years have been COVID related. Many of those funds go straight to school systems uh, that, uh, that you know, were most impacted uh, by, uh, by COVID. Uh, so the state's budget is not based on those funds. Now, federal funds do, almost a third of the state budget, about 30% of the state budget is uh, uh, education and, uh, and Medicaid type money that the state is administering. Uh, but the state's uh, budget that we passed this past year, $109.9 billion, is not based on that federal funding. There'll be some additional money that comes uh, through infrastructure bill, but those funds flow through the state to be administered. But Florida uh, is not dependent on federal money by any means. Uh, uh, our uh, Thank goodness we don't have an income tax. We have a sales tax in Florida. And with as many tourists that are traveling to Florida now that we're open, uh, we've got a significant uh, surplus, $22 billion in our three budget stabilization funds. That's, that's Florida savings accounts. Uh, and we're using that money to make investments for Florida going forward. And I'm, I'm pleased where we are fiscally uh, very sound because we have to pass a balanced budget in the state of Florida. Thank you, um, Ms. Henry. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for having us both here to speak to, to you and to the voters. I think the way we understand the increased support from the federal government is really uh, crucial here. We all knew or, or certainly should have known that this was not a long-term funding source and state leadership should have always been prepared to and using it to help those most disadvantaged by the pandemic and then planning on losing it when the crisis ended. And frankly, coming from the nonprofit world where budgets are always tight and donors can drop or change priorities at a moment's notice, I'm experienced with navigating those kinds of significant budget changes, both those that are abrupt and those that are pre-planned. And, and when we're looking at how kind of funding at the state level is invested, I think the crucial spending priorities here in District 38 are affordable housing and increased protection for our natural resources. With uh, the high number of young families and recent graduates here, investing in smart and environmentally responsible development is just a, a smart next step for the sustained economic future here in Seminole County. Uh, so, so I really see that as one of the key spending priorities here in District 38 and one that I'm looking forward to advocating for in the legislature. Thank you so much. Um, and, and one of the other, obviously, the very big issues and, and Reverend Smith touched on this, both of you, um, is the funding funding schools, which the um, legislature partners with local taxpayers on as well. Um, and that the state legislature has taken some steps to help, especially with starting teachers. But there is a great deal of concern that the state is still facing a crisis um, 
upcoming crisis when it comes to a teacher shortage where where what more what are the next steps to prevent um, um, districts from having to, to scramble to fill classrooms and uh, Ms. Henry if you want to start with that one great I really believe the answer here is straightforward pay teachers what they're worth and treat them like the professionals they are the increase in first year teacher pay barely moved Florida out of the bottom in average teacher pay and it created dangerous salary compression in that marketplace. So we're now seeing teachers who have been in the classroom for nearly two decades, serving our students and building our futures, but they're only making a few thousand dollars a year more than first year teachers. And when we lose those veteran classroom professionals, we lose the mentorship, the support, the community that is crucial to the continuing development of early career educators, but also crucial to the continuing development of our students. Uh, and I hate to sound like a broken record here, but I also think that we need more affordable housing options. I think these are interlocking issues. When teachers can't afford to live near the schools they teach in, frankly, that profession becomes a lot less attractive. Thank you, Representative Smith. Well, we've uh, put over, since I've been in the legislature over the last four years, we've added $2 billion to teacher pay raises. And these aren't bonuses. This is year over year recurring dollars. Um, and Governor DeSantis made a campaign pledge uh, four years ago to increase that starting teacher pay to 47500 And we've done that. We begin to add money to the veteran teachers. Uh, but first off, we had to get teacher and starting teacher pay raise. And you really have to think about this as like first aid. Uh, we've got to get people into the classroom because they were leaving Florida school. Somebody would get a degree at UCF and they'd go to Georgia because in Georgia they could make $14,500 more a month or a, a year as a teacher in Georgia than Florida. So you, it's first aid. You deal with the starting teachers, and then we have come back adding hundreds of millions of dollars for veteran teachers, but we're not done yet. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, veteran teachers aren't leaving the classroom because of pay. They're leaving the classroom because of politics being pulled into their classrooms. That's why they're leaving. Uh, and, and we've done some things in the legislature to stop that also. But additionally, our hometown heroes making it more affordable for a teacher to live in the area. We've placed that on the ballot in November where those teachers will be able to get an additional $50,000 homestead exemption to make it just a little bit easier to live in the district where they uh, where they serve in the schools. I'm pleased with what the legislature's done, but we're not finished yet. If I can follow up on that for, for both of you, sort of wrapped into the, the, the teacher pay, teacher shortage issue is teacher certification. Right now we're in a situation where because of the teacher shortage, in some cases the, there's there's proposals out there to to bring veterans in to teach. There, there are other people who you know, have, have a degree in one or the other, but perhaps not the certification. Um, where do you stand on that? Is that a short-term fix that should go away soon, or, or is that uh, the wrong way to go about it? Uh, Representative Smith, let's start with you. Well, the uh, Soldiers to Teacher program has been a federal program that's been in existence for, I know, as long as I was in the Marine Corps during my 30-year career. Uh, we brought that to Florida specifically to, to help. I don't know that it's a short-term measure or not. They have a couple of years to get certified, uh, but this is not unqualified veterans serving in our classrooms. You're absolutely qualified uh, through testing before anybody teaches in a Florida classroom. I think it's a good program. It's a pilot program. We'll see how it progresses and see if we need to keep it longer term. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's a, it's a good quick fix for Florida classrooms and, and we need the continuity and the stability in classrooms because there's two main reasons why children don't, don't learn when they come to school. First off is they're hungry, which we're working on, and also their teachers turn over with repeated substitutes and those kind of things. And that lack of continuity is a problem. And this uh, putting the troops to teacher program in Florida, I think is a good step uh, to get qualified individuals into our classrooms. I supported it. I voted for the bill. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Henry, what are your thoughts on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, on the topic? 
Yeah, thank you. And and I appreciate the opportunity to expand on this because you're exactly right. Certification is a crucial measure and, and very valuable in our classrooms. And I think the, the Troops to Teachers program is concerning. I'm deeply appreciative of the service that Representative Smith has given this country of all of the service that our veterans have given, including many of my family members. Uh, and I know that being in, in the military and excelling in those uh, forces requires a unique and valuable set of skills. And I think as does being a teacher. And, and that's what we're asking for is for teachers to be treated like the classroom professionals they are. And I think that those sets of skills while valuable are entirely different. Uh, and we should be investing more in training and certifying folks who are driven to become classroom professionals and educators uh, rather than investing in sort of I, what I think is a short-term Band-Aid that is not going to work to the benefit of our students. I wanted to um, ask about um, a decision that the legislature made at the time that the Affordable Care Act was, was being implemented and, and, and initiated. Um, Representative Smith, the, the state decided not to expand Medicaid to include opportunities for working adults. Um, and right now, as it stands, Florida is only one of 12 states that doesn't offer some access for working adults um, to buy into Medicaid. Do you think it's time to re-examine that decision, um, given the experience in other states? And, and if, um, if not, do you see any alternatives for Floridians who are still struggling to find health insurance? Well, the bill you're talking about for Florida to expand Medicaid uh, happened years before I was elected to the legislature. So I can't tell you, I haven't read that bill. Uh, I don't know of any bills that are being potentially proposed in 2023. I would have to read the bill to tell you how I would vote on it. And I can just tell you the process I use. Uh, I, I read every bill I vote on. I read the staff analysis that talks about the fiscal impact, the constitutionality, the impact on other legislation or laws that are on the books. Uh, and, uh, and then if I have questions there, I talk to the bill sponsor. That's, that's the uh, due diligence that I do before I vote on any bill. Uh, so I, I can't tell you how I might vote on a bill that I haven't read yet. Okay, that makes sense. I, um, I, I did know that you weren't in the legislature at the time I, I didn't intend to say that, that it was something that you didn't do. I just was curious about the issue. Um, Ms. Henry, would you like to, uh, to, to address that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I absolutely support the continued expansion of Medicaid. I think we know that Medicaid expansion has a whole host of benefits besides keeping our communities immediately healthy and, and in the long term. And each of these benefits kind of extol the value add that's inherent in this proposal. Having Medicaid means that people have access to health care sooner than they may otherwise, which reduces instances of medical bankruptcy. And in communities with expanded Medicaid, there's actually an increase in the overall survival rates in folks diagnosed with cancer. I mean, this is a natural step we can take to preserve the health of our communities. And while I think that the steps that the legislature has taken to provide increased access to new mothers is a wonderful policy, I don't believe that it goes far enough in helping Floridians access affordable health care. Thank you both. I wanted to uh, change gears real quick and talk about abortion, actually, because uh, that's obviously been a hot topic the last several months with the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision being reverted back to the states. I wonder, you know, now that it has been reverted back to the states, from a legislative perspective, what, uh, how far should the legislature go in terms of, of, of legislating abortion and, and putting in restrictions and that sort of thing? Uh, Ms. Henry, let's start with you on that one. Thank you. Obviously, this issue is top of mind for us as candidates, of course, but also for voters. We hear constantly at the doors or on the phones about folks who are deeply concerned that their personal rights are being trampled on. And no matter how an individual personally feels about abortion, the decision of if and when to start a family is deeply personal. And I don't believe that politicians have a place in that decision. 
every pregnancy, every circumstance is so unique that it is unrealistic and, and frankly impossible for a legislator in Tallahassee to know all of the factors that are involved in such a personal choice. These barriers to abortion access and especially the drive to eliminate any exemptions, even in cases of rape or incest or to save a mother's life, are deeply concerning and it's a vast overreach by the state government to legislate our bodies. So I can tell you, as a state representative, I will do everything in my power to restore and protect reproductive freedom. Thank you, Representative Smith. What are what are your feelings on the matter, uh, specifically when it comes to the the uh, the restrictions or lack thereof that Ms. Henry mentioned? Yeah, well, I can tell you first and foremost, as I knock on doors and talk to people, abortion is not top of people's minds in this race. Uh, inflation is, the price of gas, the cost of few, uh, fuel, things that are impacting their families are far more important to working families in Central Florida than abortion. But I can tell you, I'm, I am a pro-life candidate. Uh, I voted for the 15 ban restriction, uh, 15 week restriction. Uh, you know, I think the right to be born is a right we need to protect. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the bill we passed last session uh, is being challenged in the courts. It's being worked. You know, I really think it's presumptive for people to think uh, that, that we might even take up legislation in 2023 until this is worked. The legislature works very iteratively. We pass a bill. We look at it. We see how it impacts Floridians. Maybe we come back in a year or two. We look at it again. We do this through education. We do this through the environment. We do this through healthcare issues. So we'll continue to look at this, uh, but uh, uh, this idea that people are trying to make this election all about abortion, it's simply not true. And I know that from the thousands of doors that I've knocked on and the people that I've spoken to, that pocketbook issues and things that are impacting folks' lives, like the cost of fuel and like homeowners insurance and a few other things, uh, abortion is way down the list of people's priorities in Central Florida. Can I follow well, up with you, Representative Smith, very quickly? Um, I take it from your answer, you did vote for the uh, for the 15 week ban. What are your opinions on the restrictions there in terms of rape and incest in the life of the mother? Well, I'll tell you, that's one of the reasons. It's a good question. That's one of the reasons these people that keep talking about Florida will ban abortion. That is not true. That is false. Why? Because they don't have the votes. I would never vote for a bill that criminalizes women or that would prevent a woman from being able to save her own life. And, you know, I can't imagine being a husband uh, that's there with the, the mother of a child and having to choose between that child or the mother. I would never want that mother to be put in that position. So the idea that Florida is going to ban abortion like that is simply not true. The other issues on 15 weeks, 12 weeks, six weeks, heartbeat, the policy differences that we have, whether there's exemptions for rape or incest, which are very few in the state of Florida or others, that's what the deliberative, collaborative approach of the legislative process will work out. Maybe in 2023, maybe not. We'll, we'll know when we have a bill. And, and as somebody who's plugged into Republican leadership, I've not received any uh, draft legislation to read or offer an opinion on or, or where would I stand on. So I, I think a lot of this is a made up uh, political approach right now. I want to get right back to the pocketbook issue that is foremost in everybody's brain right now. Um, with with Ian hot on our hot on our coast, we we were already in what most people describe as a property insurance crisis with companies failing, dropping policies, um, leaving the state. And I, I'd like to ask what you think the best next step is for Florida to recover its property insurance market and build a stronger base going forward. Um, so I'm sure it's something you've both given a lot of thought to. So and if we could start with uh, Representative Smith, I'd like to get your ideas as the best options for Florida going forward. 
Yeah, well, we uh, we passed a bill in a special session uh, because property insurance uh, is so important and it is an issue. And it's been an issue for some number of years as Florida companies are leaving. Keep in mind, now I sit on the insurance and banking committee. So 94% of insurance written homeowners insurance in Florida are written by Florida companies. We have a difficult time attracting big insurance companies from around the country or even around the world to write policies in Florida. Some of it's because of hurricane, uh, but most of it is due to litigation risks. Now we have an issue with hurricanes uh, because we had five named storms in a row. Uh, that makes some actuarial issues uh, that have caused some companies to say, I'm not writing policies in Florida. So to stabilize the market and keep insurance companies from leaving Florida or stop writing policies, we created a wrap fund, which is a reinsurance. Insurance companies have insurance and it's called reinsurance. So we set aside $2 billion. I, I think it should have been four to stabilize the market so companies quit leaving Florida and they write more policies because what we need is the supply and demand. We need more Florida companies to write policies that creates competition is which is going to drive down rates. Now the money that we put there but in the wrap fund, those companies are required by law to pass those savings on to those homeowner customers. Uh, so I think that was a step in the right direction, but we have more work to do and an insurance bill will be the first bill I file in the 2023 legislative session. Ms. Henry. Thank you. And, and this question is, as you mentioned, obviously critical given the, the, uh, hurricane headed our way, but also especially frustrating because of the massive taxpayer expense that went into hosting a special session to address this very issue. And yet the average Floridian now pays $2,200 more for property insurance, which doesn't even begin to address the thousands of homeowners who have been dropped from their provider with little notice and are forced to seek support elsewhere. And I know folks are worried about how they're going to be able to afford to rebuild if needed in the coming weeks. Um, so I will work to check the international reinsurance industry, like Representative Smith said, companies that insure the insurers. But I don't believe that the solution is a $2 billion bailout that comes from the pockets of the taxpayers. And I don't believe that a $4 billion bailout will solve that either. I believe that we need Ext more extreme government intervention to regulate and assure these companies as opposed to providing them with funding on our behalf. Thank you so much. Um, I There is one more issue that is a very big deal in Central Florida, um, and that is the way the state funds and manages tourism. Um, and um, right now, obviously, we have the statewide tourism marketing arm visit florida and first just quickly i'd like both of you to give me your assessment on the job visit florida is doing and whether it's the effective strategy for marketing and developing tourism in florida um and and miss henry if we could start with you wonderful thank you um i uh I completely agree that right now Central Florida is, of course, reliant on our tourism industry, this sort of $75 billion industry, but it was built on the backs of tourism workers who need affordable housing, who need transportation infrastructure. And those are crises that we're facing right now. So I believe that the legislature should be doing everything in its power, uh, both on committees and boards and, and of course on the floor to work to address these immediate crises. We won't be able to sustain a continued tourism industry and one that, as you referenced, drives the economy of the region without ensuring that the workers who, who are crucial to this uh, have some protections. And while I think that the, the convention center and the advertising done by Visit Florida and Visit Orlando are, are absolutely beneficial to our local economy, Central Florida should have more control over what projects those hotel taxes and the other revenue there helps fund. Representative Smith. Well, before I answer the question on tourism, I'd like to bring, call your attention and anybody that watches this video back to the comments my opponent made regarding homeowners insurance. And it sums up this race when she says extreme government intervention. 
It's what she believes is needed. And that's a dangerous course of action. So now regarding the tourism, I'll tell you, Florida's tourism is going great. Uh, there's pent up demand due to COVID and people are visiting. You know, you think about this, uh, of all the foreign tourists that came to the United States, all 50 states last year, 45% of them came to Florida. And they came to Florida and they spent a lot of money uh, and, and because we were open. And now we have the money in our savings and we have the money for teacher pay raises. We have the money to expand our uh, state college system so they can do more of the trades, the HVAC, plumbing, electrical work, because we need that trained and skilled workforce. And we also have more money to invest in uh, environmental restoration and preservation because the state is generating sales tax revenue a lot from foreign uh, uh, tourists that come here. And, and Governor DeSantis kept our state open when other blue states, lockdown states, and those failed policies are now running into serious budget crunches. Florida has $22 billion in savings. And I tell you, as we start to address problems or Florida's problems in the future, it's a lot easier to do it when you have money uh, and I think we're on a good setting and, uh, and I think tourism will continue to build uh, for Florida's future. And I wanted to um, make our last question one about an issue that you've both mentioned a couple times already. Um, Florida is being hit um, harder than anybody really anticipated by the affordable housing crisis. And um, we're not used to thinking of ourselves as one of the most affordable one of the most expensive housing markets in the country. We've always believed that Florida was cheap. And, and now we have a situation where middle-class families cannot find um, attractive housing options. So where, what are the best places for the state legislature to be devoting its efforts to developing and encouraging more affordable housing stock? Um, and we'll start with uh, Ms. Henry. Wonderful, thank you. I think that the first crucial step in addressing the affordable housing crisis, and you're exactly right, that's what it is, a crisis. And here in Central Florida, with so many incredible institutions of higher education, with an incredibly strong public school system that brings people to the region, we're looking at young families and recent graduates who want to stay here who have begun to put down roots here and want to own a home. Uh, and I think the first crucial step is to invest in the original funding of the Sadowski Affordable Housing Trust Funds. These are supplies that are meant to be accessible to Floridians to help with down payments, with repairs and preservations, and even to incentivize and encourage further affordable housing development. But those funds were swept by a legislature that wanted to put them into preferred programs by the folks in power. And while there have been some protections passed in the meantime, after you know a, an outroar by folks who, who needed that funding and, and were concerned about what was going on, um, the funds have not been appropriately resupplied. So reinvesting in those funds would be a crucial first step. And of course, doing everything in my power to make my constituents aware and available to access those funds. Well, let's be clear. Uh, we, you know, the Central Florida market, we lead the nation in two areas. Uh, one is lack of affordable housing, and the other is vehicle pedestrian accidents. So we don't wanna be number one in either one of those, car uh, in those categories. But I tell you, the state legislature, we don't approve developmental agreements. We don't do planning and zoning. Those are done at the municipal level uh, and at the county level. We set a business climate for people to be able to build. We have a lack of housing in Central Florida and throughout the state because coming out of the great recession that we suffered 10, 12 years ago, builders stopped building. And then, and then uh, municipalities, it was uh, not in my neighborhood, did not want to build apartments, didn't want to build duplexes, even in some areas, didn't want to expand single family homes. So we didn't get into this situation overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. There is no uh, uh, magic wand in the legislature uh, to, to fix this. It's going to be done at the municipal and county level. We set a tone in Tallahassee for building. 
uh, and, and through comprehensive plans and the requirements. And I'll tell you, uh, the Sadowski Trust Fund hasn't been swept in years. And as a matter of fact, last year we passed a bill that now prevents it's against the law to try to sweep that fund. There is more money going into the ship and sale programs. Those are the two programs of the Sadowski that allow for uh, down payment assistance uh, and for uh, reduction of impact fees. So builders will build and pass those savings on to those, those new homeowners. So those programs are there. They exist today. They have more money than they ever had. And you cannot legally sweep those funds. It's just not being done. It's a talking point that is false. Thank, thank you both so much. Um, and I just wanted to let the people who are watching this know um, that while the Orlando Sentinel will be making an endorsement in this race, we don't expect to make up anybody's mind for them. We urge you, both of these candidates have good websites with tons of information on it. They've been making public appearances. The Sentinel has been covering their races and will continue to do so. And what we ask people to do is take a good look at both of them, compare your values and, um, and, and the things that you think are important with what they've told you that they stand for, and then make sure that you go to the polls on November 8th and make your best choice for this race. And with that, I'm gonna ask both of our candidates to tell us why they think they are that choice. Um, Ms. Henry, let's start with you. Wonderful, thank you. I'm Sarah Henry, and I'm running to represent District 38. I'm an experienced nonprofit professional with a deep commitment to public service, inspired in large part by my grandfather's career in the Navy and my mom's commitment to justice as a civil rights attorney. I'll work to fully fund our public schools, making sure that teachers have access to the resources they need and the respect they deserve. I'll work to restore our personal medical choices, trusting women and their doctors to make the choices that are right for them. I'll fight to keep people in their homes and to help young families afford their first homes. I'll be one of the youngest serving members of the State House, and I believe that that is important the old way, career politicians who treat the honor of public service as their entitlement is failing our communities. It's time for fresh new voices, and I pledge to work for you. Thank you so much to the Sentinel for having us here today to speak about the challenges that we're facing together. Thank you so much. And Representative Smith, why don't you help us close this out? Well, I appreciate the Sentinel doing this. So I'm Colonel David Smith, the United States Marine Corps retired. After a 30 year career uh, where I was trained to solve problems, I was elected to the Florida legislature four years ago. I'm a combat veteran, one of the few serving in the legislature today. So I understand veteran issues that are important to Seminole County and throughout Central Florida. Since I was elected, we've passed the single largest teacher pay raise in the state history of Florida. We have more money going into environmental restoration and preservation than in the history of the state. Something that people don't really talk about, but the Florida retirement system, which would be important to you if you're a teacher, is fully funded. And if I read the spreadsheet correctly, we actually may be slightly overfunded. I've passed six clean water bills that impact Seminole County to clean up Lake Jessup and Lake Monroe. I've passed wildlife protection bills for Florida. I don't talk about things. I do things. I passed bills. Uh, matter of fact, the first fair housing bill passed in Florida in 20 years. Uh, I passed the juvenile justice reform bill. People talk about justice reform. I don't talk about justice reform. I pass legislation. I didn't go to Tallahassee to be a thought leader or to extend the discussion or to be uh, just a, a mindless drone. I went there to pass legislation that helps the people in my district. I've been doing that for the first four years. And if you know nothing else about politics, I'm sure you'll know that seniority matters. And as I move up in leadership, I will be able to do more things for more of my constituents in Seminole County. So I appreciate your vote. I'm David Smith.